I think South Jersey, I mean, has many unique small micro environments all over the place, interesting little villages and interesting woodlands and, and great vegetation. It's really a jungle of vegetation and variety and diversity. And I think as a whole, South Jersey has uh, a kind of a collective consciousness about itself. You know, there is a kind of a feeling to this area, particularly I find it near the bay. There is a kind of a sense of place about the region that is reflected in the history of the area, it's reflected in the architecture, it's reflected in the quality of light that we talked about, it's reflected in the people, the animals that inhabit it, it's reflected in, in everything that's here, and it influences everything that's here. And it's just part of this vast mine of history that exists here, which is very unique to this place. I think that the feelings that I have about the Bayshore are mostly this overwhelming sense that there's a spirit here that's very unique to this place. And I can't say that I'm like a great traveler and a great experiencer of other locations, but I, I have a sense that there's something here, maybe this 10 or 15 mile radius of land, the Bayshore, that doesn't exist anywhere else a sense of identity. Like the breezes that blow across the Manenico, I feel her warm, gentle breath on my cheek. With my arms around her waist, she moves like an angel as we float past East Point to Dias Creek. From the oak woods of Claremont to the four skewed. The three artists that I have here exhibited today um, with, with flat art, I thought were artists that really represented the area and yet were each in their own way very unique. Glenn, I think, does very realistic work, but work that is almost YF-esque, if you will, that really show the area and, and leave little doubt to exactly what you're seeing and what you can really feel in his work. I think in complete kind of contrast to that is Pat Witt's work, where Pat's more impressionistic and allows you to to get the feel and experience the marsh and allow you to then put yourself into that. And, and Belva is kind of that in-between where she's given you so much of the detail and allows you to fill in the gaps. All of them seem to represent certainly what I see as the real heart of this region, and that's the wetland or the close tie to the wetland that we all have. Uh, this whole region, as a down Jersey area, certainly has huge percentages of area that are wetland. And if we're not wetland, we're upland edge of wetland, and that whole transition to wetland. And so all of them seem to represent both field or wetland or, or marsh or creek it just kind of exudes what we are, and that's that tie to the wetland down here that makes us so unique. My grandfather had a history of family oystering on the Morris River. I have some really vague childhood memories of being with him on his boats when they were wintered over in Morristown, near the old Morristown Bridge. and. My mother's side of the family, you know, was into oystering. My father's side were glass blowers. And so I think both my mother and my father probably reflected traditions that really go deep into southern New Jersey. I first thought of myself as an artist quite arrogantly uh, at the age of three. <laughs> I remember it really well. I copied a cat off the cover of a, uh, a magazine. It must have been like a ladies' home journal or something. And everybody in the family just thought this, this was just incredible stuff. Of course, it wasn't, but you know, everybody thought so. So then I thought so. And consequently, uh, I guess that shot me on my trajectory of painting from the age of three. But I always felt from the time I was conscious of it, that I wanted to be an artist.
Oh, the atmospheres are amazing, I think, on uh, the Delaware Bay especially, and the marshes, and the woodlands. There's an air quality in South Jersey, and I don't know what it is. It may be the humidity in the air, it may be the angle of the light, it's probably a combination of the two, but, but there is a difference to the quality of light in South Jersey, and I think a lot of painters that are landscape painters, they see that and they relate to that. And I find that to be rather intriguing to capture that sort of ephemeral, fleeting quality of light. And I love it when you get late afternoons and you sort of have these mists that come in across the marshes and across the fields. And they really do take on a kind of a spiritual quality. And uh, it's nice to be there and try to catch a little of that once in a while. The other place I like a lot is coming into Greenwich. There's a beautiful field that's frequently it's plowed and, and in the fall it's wonderful in terms it has beautiful uh, yarrow and Queen Anne's lace that's sort of beginning to dry and, and you can look through the trees and see a bit of the river through this field. In the winter you see the plowed furrows in the field and sometimes frost will be highlighted on them so it always looks different and that's an area that I like to see in the early morning because it has more of an east face and again you get incredible lights and colors coming across the marsh onto the field with the border of trees so that seems to be a spot that draws me back a lot being around marshes where any broad open spaces, farm fields often do the same thing. The fields of the Bayside Track next to my house are very broad and expansive. There's a feeling of one's um, relative smallness in relation to such huge forces. And, uh, and I think the marshes sort of remind us, you know, of our, our place in things. And maybe there's a little bit of humility that comes from being in these vast spaces. Some people find it in the west in canyons, some people find it on the ocean, and I think for some people in our region we find it in the marshes and the broad fields. And keeping, again, those, those places is really incredibly important because we're losing so much of that. And I think it's important to have that, that place where you can go where it is quiet, you do find some solitude, you are with nature, and, and you can be aware of your, your relative place in the scheme of life. When I think of Glenn Rutterow, I think of a triumph of the human spirit. His work is so extraordinary. I, there is not another painter anywhere that I admire more than, than Glenn, and I think he has a great diversity in his work. And Glenn's work has a quality in its expression, no matter what particular phase of his work that, that you see it over a period of years. I always find myself coming away with the sense that this person really has a, a, an amazing gift. And I, I think something of that comes from who Glenn is as, as a person. And, and he certainly captures something of the, the spirit and the feel of South Jersey in a way that is really unmatched by anybody else. One of the things that I find really fascinating about uh, the whole area in general and the different structures, the buildings, and what was kind of left over from man's activities is the sense that they all tell a story. And then there are times when just the sheer beauty of the structure of a building appeals to me and think, gee, I have to stop and paint that. By adding people to paintings, I feel that you, you change the, the psychology of the painting. First of all, the most obvious effect with a person in a painting or in the image is that the viewer is going to identify with the person first rather than the painting itself, especially if the person is obvious. 
or you know it's not hidden or very small so if you the viewer is looking at that person first it, it becomes an important part of the painting and what you want the painting to portray for instance if if i'm thinking about the structure of a building in a painting as being the important reason why i'm doing the painting then it might not be as good for me to have a person prominent in the painting. Because psychologically, as I said, as soon as a person is in the painting, the viewer identifies with the person. And I think psychologically, if you put two people in a painting, two people are communicating with each other first, and then with the viewer second. So you're an, another step away from the uh, intent of the painting if your intent is something other than that. So. When I think about people in paintings, I'm thinking about how they dialogue or how they create a dialogue with the subject matter, the painting itself, and then of course how they relate to the viewer. Uh, what impressed me about the Bertram's farm was that you could go there and just paint and that you have two wonderful people that were totally supportive and friendly and happy to see you every time you, were, you came there. And for a long time, I painted at the, the Twins Farm. I would go right for the house, like I wanted to paint the house. And that's all I could see. And then the more I did that, I would start to see, well, this house is sitting in an environment that it's sitting on top of a hill that overlooks the river that overlooks the marsh, et cetera. And there's fields that lead up to the house. There's the, the diked in fields and the dike itself and all these wonderful compositional elements. And I spent many years just thinking about that. And then all of a sudden, um, my vision included the twins. And there they were, like standing alongside the house or doing their activities of the farm chores. And I'm thinking, well, there is much a part of this as anything else that's here, including the house. If I were to think what makes a painting mine or why is my painting any different than someone else's or how someone perceives it, it's a very difficult kind of question because I'm right in the heat of the battle, so to speak. Uh, the art historian might be able to decide that better. But there is one thing that I would hope and that is that a person had a sense that I was there and that I was experiencing what I was painting and that I had a feeling for it. And even possibly or hopefully, they would look at my work and say, uh, there's a spirit there, that this painting is alive. And not every painting has that. And certainly not every painting of mine has that. But hopefully, in the long run, uh, there will be enough of them that that might be what people remember my work by. In all seriousness, I never really considered myself an artist. I considered myself a painter. And, uh, and that's probably to quote Thomas Aikens, because that's what he said. But as the last couple of years, I was thinking, well, here I am in my 40s. I am an artist. And it's like, it was a revelation. <laughs> I'm an artist. <laughs> One of the first things I remember about Pat Witt was at the age of 16 uh, and going to the barn studio, that nothing was too much trouble for Pat. And for me, especially in sitting in a wheelchair, it was difficult sometimes to be outside and to move around. And Pat was infamous for her nature walks through, at that time, through the fields and woods behind her barn. And uh, I remember being hauled by other students <laughs> uh, through the brambles and the briars and the flowers and everything so that I could um, participate in that activity. And that's one of the first memories I have of Pat Witt, that nothing was too much trouble for her to get you out and to see nature and see the trees and the sky. Some children start here when they're four and five years old and staying here until they graduate from high school. And then they go into an art field. Doesn't matter if they're gonna become artists or uh, what they're gonna do. The, the important thing is that they learn 
about themselves and have confidence and it builds their self-esteem. Some will be teachers, some are coming back here and bringing their children and their children. And that's the way it goes. It's carrying it on and passing it on. Some of the adults, the parents will say, some of my fondest memories of growing up was spent at the barn. The greatest thing for me is to continue going to the same places. Sometimes said, why do you go? And I said, well, it's a sense of place. You just know it is your place to be. And that's for me. Maybe it's because I was born and raised along the Marsh River. I could not do a cityscape, you know, the tall, all verticals. No, I got to do the horizontals. And many times um, uh, people will say to me, I never see any pe people in your paintings. And you know, psychologically, that's supposed to have some meaning. Or uh, if you see a bear tree, you know, all these things. And I, I'm always honored when uh, meteorologists uh, or an um, uh, astronomer, um, some of the um, great people of, of nature will always say, I know right where that place is that you're painting from, or the crabbers or the hunters, clamorers, fishermen, they always know where that place is. And I think it is so wonderful because they are able to identify to their place. See, that's their place too, you see, and they understand it. Wow, Ruth, that is so magnificent. You've got the whole spirit of it. The whole idea of the meadows and the look at the cloud. They've been hanging around. I'm wonderful. Another thunderhead is building. And the colors. I love the color ground that you used. I can remember um, uh, one time, my favorite time was I, I would go along and um, paint the uh, neighbor's mailboxes, put designs on them. They said, Oh, uh, Patsy, you just made our mailboxes so beautiful and they would give me a dollar. So then I realized I could earn money. <laughs> but, uh, and dollar back in the 30s was pretty good money. If I told you to stop right now, would you? I, there's part of me that wants to stop and, and do the oranges of sunset. Well, no, it's to, gone. Just leave it? By the time it's you gone. even think about right. the thought of it, yeah. look at this. This is a gem. It's a turner. It's a constable. It's a Libby. Okay. <laughs> So what happened, I started having uh, art shows up in the attic in the, uh, at the farmhouse. It was a big farmhouse. And I would hang all my artwork and then invite people up, and I charged them three cents. It's so beautiful and so misty and so typical of South Jersey. This mm -hmm. is why I love it here. I just love it. And get some, uh, put white over that. Do it while I'm watching if you want to. I have to do it while you're watching. <laughs> yeah. My greatest surprise was at age 10, um, uh, my Uncle Joe Van Allen, another Dutch uncle, um, made my easel, a beautiful easel. It's still here. Now watch the, um, the yellow greens out there and how the humidity softens, always softens. And again, my eye is on that thunderhead and it's just beautiful. It's taking a great shape. See, already it's changing. So to keep up with this, you have to really move fast. So the sky becomes almost um, opaque. These are my granddaughters, Kelly and Debbie. We have third generation coming up here with us wits. They keep my wits about me. And uh, one daughter is a, a potter and a painter and a paper maker. Uh, granddaughter Kelly uh, is, um, she'll be graduating in art therapy from her college. And we just feel like the art spirit lives in all of us. It's something that we just, that power of positive thinking and feeling just really just keeps growing and growing through the family. It's uh, something that I guess she just is captured from within and is just expressed out here on the canvases. And I think it's something that we'd all like to capture a part of and, and take, keep it within ourselves. Well, I think that she makes us appreciate the art and the different colors and um, especially the sunsets. 
um, instead of just looking at it thinking, oh, it's the sun, there's something spiritual about it that is incredible. Adel, every time I see a sunrise or a sunset, oh, what that. better way to have someone remember you, you know? Every time I see the sunset, I think of my grandmother, you know? It's just <laughs> the explosion of the colors and everything. One of my favorite glass blowers, of course, is Don Farrell because I could see marsh paintings or wetland paintings in his glass. The magic of fire and sand and his artistic touch, oh, I just, I love his work. The first two years as an as uh, art major, yeah, I studied pottery. I actually helped build the first pottery studio here at Wheaton Village. I've always enjoyed working with clay, but I, I found the glass was a lot more spontaneous material to work it with, and, and for my personality, I think a lot more uh, conducive to creativity. Some of the earlier work that I started, uh, I guess, depicting some of the, the marsh images in, um, I would be uh, I would be riding back. Like most of the most of the better hunting times were daybreak and dawn, which is probably the most color-oriented times if you ever spend any time out there then. Uh, and I might be riding back in my little 14-foot John boat on the way back before the sunset and and just come around a, a curve and just be flashed with this tree line and maybe the gray sky or the pink sky behind that. And I started thinking how I could get some of those images into some of my work or maybe create the impression of some of those images into my work by, by changing the, the colors that I work with, with the iridescence on the surface and maybe the opaqueness at the top and having a transition area in between. Um, I would spend a lot of time out there when, when you're hunting, laying down, looking through reeds. And then I started actually drawing reeds onto the surface of the iridescence with the opaqueness and maybe putting in a few um, bits of of certain colors at the skyline just to create uh, the impression of birds, for example. So uh, I think the p people who are familiar with, with my work would, would know my story and what the work's about. But for those who don't, uh, you know, if, if you pick it up and hold it in a light, light and just allow yourself to see it, everybody sees something different in it. But ultimately, everybody sees some kind of scene in the marshes. Nice South Jersey is rich in all the resources that it takes to produce glass. And it wasn't probably until maybe, uh, I don't know the exact dates, but Duran glass, where I would say art glass was actually made here in South Jersey. Uh, there are some pieces in the museum, some of the whimsies that are very collectible, the Millville Rose, uh, South Jersey lily pad picture, different things like that that were a byproduct or developed in this region. Uh, didn't come over from the European glass houses that uh, are very collectible, but but I don't think they were ever looked at as art glass. They were they were whimsies, and either the glass workers traded with them, or they uh, gave them to the families or special friends for gifts. With my glass, I actually lay out a, a pattern or like the drawing, and I roll the hot glass into it on the surface, thicker down the bottom where I want it to be more texture, thinner up the top like where the sky is going to be or, or whatever. Draw, say, through it with the reeds to create the, the illusion that I'm going for. And then when I blow the piece out, achieve the shape that I want, and, and basically the piece is done except for applying the iridescence, then I, I kind of very carefully build up layers. So I don't get like a rainbow effect, but I get like a controlled color where I, where, where I'm, I want it to be. I guess over the years I've done any variety of, of numbers of uh, series of pieces, the marshscapes being included in one of them. But during that same period of time, I was doing other, other pieces for other shows. And then when we were asked to kind of do that show, for that block of time, I just specifically tried to concentrate on the marshscape series. And out of that kind of evolved I think on some of the pieces, a little bit more suggestive kind of color application on the surface to kind of create the illusion of maybe water or a stronger sky. If someone who doesn't know what I'm working on can see the work, 
and say, oh, this reminds me of, of the marshes of, of wherever. If they're from Maine, it doesn't matter to me, you know. But when an individual can see that, uh, that I was trying to say something, but they see it, that's kind of, you know, the ultimate compliment, I think. Like the breezes that blow across the Manenico, I feel her warm, gentle breath on my cheek. With my arms around her waist, she moves like an angel as we float past East Point Dias Creek. From the oak woods of Claremont to the Fort Skew Beach. You know, this is where you are. This is South Jersey. We're considered regional artists. Uh, this is our region, and I think that's very important. An artist has its their sense of place, see? Uh, the marshes and the wetlands is my sense of place, but it all comes together as our place. Won't you dance with me, darling? I think for the landscape to survive in some way, people have to wake up and realize that you can't indiscriminately change things without being conscious of some effect that it's going to have. This land has already been affected by 200 or so years of man uh, intervention on it, but hopefully we can wake up. And I think one thing I, I like about it, that it's, it's such a vast area, that it's a real easy place to go and, and get lost, uh, not in the sense that I don't know where I am, but in the sense that I know that where I am, I'm completely alone. Bay Shore still retains that sense of wilderness about it, that it's a little wild and a little dangerous even, maybe. And that makes it kind of special. And for artists who really treasure solitude and we protect it and we love it, I think that vastness and that sense of solitude in that space is really an impressive thing, something to be preserved. <laughs>